The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're going to continue the Apple One build by attaching a keyboard and a display. Let's get started. See, I'm actually eating an apple. Amazing builds, exclusive mods, cutting edge ideas, electronics, engineering, and more. Every week on Element 14's The Ben Heck Show. In a previous episode, we made the core of the Apple One computer, which is a 6502 based computer. CPU, ROM, RAM, and a few address decoders. We used an oscilloscope to make sure the data was correct. In this episode, we're gonna get some input output going. Originally, the Apple One had a PIA, which is a peripheral interface adapter, very common, and that had some registers on it that the 6502 could read and write to. Those registers either sent data out to a TV screen or got data from an ASCII keyboard. The Apple One originally had 1,024 bytes used for its screen RAM, so every byte held whatever character was supposed to be on that position of the display. And it was actually accessed with shift registers, which is an interesting way of doing it, but it worked. It was also kind of slow. And then there was a thing called an ASCII keyboard that you could buy. I'm sure we'd have a hard time finding one now. And that would put data into the PIA that 6502 could read. Because all it really did was 6502 was like, hey, put something on the screen, or ooh, I got a key. That was it. That's all the I.O. it had. What modern replica makers do is they use a microcontroller in place of all this. Uh, so we'll use the propeller because I'm used to it. And it's also really good at generating an NTSC LCD display. So the PIA will be the same, but instead of talking to this, it will be talking to a propeller. And the propeller will take the place of all the circuitry. Also, instead of a off-the-shelf keyboard, we can make our own keyboard, you know, to have a kind of a cool retro aesthetic, and then do the roll column scanning so we can get the keys and the propeller can send them back to the 6502. So in today's episode, we're going to build this and make sure it works. I'll start this half of the unit by deciding the best placement for the components. Like the main CPU portion, everything will be socketed for convenience. Next, I'll attach a female header to match the one we've already built, and then start wiring things to it. This header has several signals we don't actually need, but it's better to have too many than not enough. I've wired up the start of the data buses. There are three on the PIA, the keyboard, the display, and the one going back to the CPU. I'm also running some power lines down the middle of the chip, power and ground. I'm attaching these in a crosshatch pattern. I want to attach the data lines first to this connection here, but the data lines are on this side of the PIA. To safely pass them over to the connector, I had to wire these connections first, and then bring them over this way so when I wire them from here to there, I can tuck them under the signals without worrying about short circuits. I have the eight data lines hooked up to the PIA that go to the CPU. Now I need to attach the other lines that go from the PIA to the propeller microcontroller. The data lines are mostly attached, and after I hook up a few address lines from the connector to the PIA, it should be ready to go. These are thin, solid copper wires that I obviously don't want to break. What I'm going to do is thread them through here, and then keep them as straight as possible and make it less susceptible to damage. It looks like all the PIA connections have been made, but to be sure, I'm going to check them with my Fluke Multimeter. Not multimeter, multimeter! <laughs> I'll put the main integrated circuits up here and the support logic circuits down here. I suppose I don't have to worry about making this super small since it will put it into a larger laptop, but why not make it as compact as possible? My bin of 8-bit computer parts. Here's the PIA, peripheral interface adapter. Let's stick it on there. We also need an inverter or not gate, which goes right here. Time to add the propeller microcontroller. We need to add some resistors on one of the data buses because the propeller runs off a different voltage than the PIA or 6502. With the resistors attached, I can now add the wires. Remember, we put the small stuff at the bottom first. I'm trying to arrange the wires as neatly as possible. Here, I'm bending an 8-bit bus at a right angle, just as you'd see on a real circuit board. All right, I have one of the buses attached from the PIA to the propeller. Now it's time to attach the second bus from the PIA to the propeller. 
the propeller drives this bus. That is, the signals go from the propeller to the PIA, so the voltage difference here isn't a problem. The input-output portion of the circuit has been wired. We have the PIA here, the peripheral interface adapter, a logic chip that goes with it. Here is the parallax propeller microcontroller and an EEPROM that will flash it a bomb boot. This is a 3.3 volt regulator because that's the voltage the propeller operates at. Here's the propeller's crystal, filtering capacitor, and the programming header. And just like the Spectrum, I made this in two halves that we can put together. Basically it's CPU, AV, just like the Spectrum. So this should work. Only one way to find out. Uh, I'm going to hook it up. I added a composite video port here, which I'm going to hook up to this display. Then we have five volts coming in here. And I'll need both my power supplies. And we don't have the keyboard yet, but we can send it serial characters from a terminal and that should work as well. So we'll see the output on the screen here and we'll give it characters from my laptop. That is until we get the keyboard attached. The propeller is sending video to the display and it's blinking a cursor, which shows that we're at the start of the screen memory. Uh, we don't really know that the apple is active until we see a slash, so I'm gonna reset the apple. Okay, that slash there tells us that the apple is ready for input. So using a serial terminal, I can send characters into the 6502, you know, even though we don't have a keyboard. Well, we do have a keyboard, it's just on my computer here. All right, so let's see if we can look at a range of addresses. Oh, cool, yeah, it works. So this is the beginning of memory. If you might recall, this is the WAS monitor. We could even look at the whole thing if we wanted. FF00, FFFF. Oh, I think I typed the wrong thing. FF0, oh yeah, FF00 dot FFFF. Wow, that's amazing. It's pretty bizarre that I'm using my modern laptop to control an ancient 6502 computer. So what it's displaying right now is it's displaying its own program, which is at the top of memory. And it's taking forever. I wonder if I can stop it. Nope, I can do it by this. Ha ha ha, take that. Okay, let's see, F, actually let's do F, F, F zero dot F, 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 F. Okay, this is the very top of memory. And if you recall before, that's the reset vector right there. 00 FF. So in the CPU boots, it goes to that memory address, which tells it to go back to FF00. And we can look at that as well with the uh, monitor. So that's pretty much all the WAS monitor does is it shows you what's in memory. So, oh look, that's what's in that memory location. FF00 contains D8. Now, if you recall, I put other things on the ROM, such as basic. So if I go to E000 space R, it will run whatever's at memory location E000, which is a basic interpreter. So now we're actually in basic. So I can basically put in, basically, <laughs> put in a program and run it. So the WAS monitor got you into the system. It at least gave you some sort of control. Once you had that, you could execute other programs or load them in from tape. So it definitely seems to be working. I mean, it's not the fastest computer, but it functions. It's control C. Oh yeah, see, we can even stop. And um, we're not in the WAS monitor anymore. I'm actually not sure if there's a command. Maybe if I can exit it. Let's see what happens if I type exit. Nope, or I can just hit reset. Okay, so now we're in the WAS monitor. Now remember, when I hit reset, the 6502 is resetting, not the propeller. Uh, let's see, let's, what else can we do? FF00, FF00, can look at the memory, 01, 02. Yeah, 
So it's, you know, it works. That's good. Do, 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 do. <laughs> okay. Um, using the serial monitor is all well and good, but I want a real keyboard on this, so we don't need anything extra. It can be his own self-contained unit. Uh, I think I'll just build my own keyboard because, you know, I want to make a custom unit out of this whole thing. Um, now, if this is a uh, laptop type thing, this is going to be our widest portion if we use this existing screen. So I want to make a QWERTY keyboard that is no wider than this screen. And another consideration is I have to make sure it has the right commands that the or keys that the Apple One keyboard had. And that's an ancient keyboard. So I think we do need things like we need the control key and a few other modifier keys. Um, but uh, I think I should be able to figure it out. So I'm going to design that. I'll draw it first, then I'll laser cut some parts, and then I'll hand wire a matrix. I'm going to make my own custom keyboard for this because that's how I roll. So standard size key is about 0.5 inches by 0.5 inches. And I've drawn them all out here in relation to the size screen we have. So, you know, the keyboard will be about as wide as the screen will allow the entire unit to be. And in this case, it's about 11 inches. So I also have to make my text. Most keyboards back then used the um, engineering drafting font, so I use that here. I had to be really sure that I had the right characters that the Apple One can process. I also need a control key and a shift key. There are no upper and lower case characters on the Apple One, but you might want to go shift two to get the at symbol, for instance. And of course, a space bar. Once I have these laid out, I can do my tack switch placements. So we can laser cut this, put tack switches in, and then manually wire the matrix. So yeah, I will laser cut this and we'll be ready to go. And yeah, so this is the basic shape that I think it's gonna take. Maybe not this color, but this basic shape. It'll fold open like that. Here's the keyboard that we hand assembled. Now I'm gonna hand wire it. It's actually not too difficult. There are rows which go horizontally and columns which go vertically. We have this much IO left on the propeller, but I want to scan a real keyboard instead of hooking up another keyboard because you know we've got a microcontroller, let's use it. But I think we have enough lines here. If we use a Johnson counter, which looks like this, we can use this to count 10 rows just by pulsing it with a line and we can also reset it. Shift and control need their own circuit because they're modifier keys. You would push one and then push another key so they'll have their own circuit. And then we have four more lines for row zero, row one, row two, and row three plus a space bar. So what'll happen is we'll clock this to clock one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lines on the Johnson counter and that will put a high on certain columns. Then if you've pushed the switch, that high voltage will feed into the row, which will normally be pulled down, and then you'll know that a key has been pushed. So if you're on column zero and you see row one has a positive voltage, you know the Q key has been pushed. So now I just have to add columns here, attach them to this Johnson counter, and then should work. It's pretty much the same method we used for the texting radio. All right, here are the columns, and here are the rows. We have 10 lines on our Johnson counter. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Which means these last few here, we're probably gonna need double up, so this one will be the same as this one, this one will be the same as this one, and vice versa, but that should be all right. It's kind of how the ZX Spectrum was, it only had like five columns, so it was, these keys were the same as these keys. But yeah, um, hopefully it'll work. Hey, hey, we've got keys showing up, woohoo! Now we can type into our Apple One computer, although I don't have debounce set up, but you know, we can see that the keys are working, so that's good. 
Okay, so we've set up that we have the ROM working, the Apple One computer is working, and we can see a display and get keys into it. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we're going to finish the build. I'm making a cool custom enclosure for the Apple One and make it 70s retro-tastic. We'll see you then. No, 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 Keanu, you are in the Matrix. You are in the Matrix. No, I'm not in the Matrix, you're in the Matrix. You are in the Matrix. Put it, they can put in a sound effect. Wait, am I supposed to eat this? Well, no, I'm gonna give you a bite sound effect. Oh, I already took a bite out of it. Hello and welcome back to the, <laughs> I'm just being cognizant if it's showing or not. Good luck editing that. What's the point of a phone you can't hang up? See what happens when I push some keys. Oh, of course, nothing because the camera is running. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com.